talking tonight about the future of our country. The We're curious thing about the rise and rise of Robert Muldoon was that the more enemies and critics he generated, the more he seemed to excite the people who would soon be known as Rob's mob. Everything was going along, everyone was going with you. The people got aroused, and obviously the speaker got aroused, and uh, it was quite exciting. Uh, Rob Muldoon really set the issues himself, and, and it was set in the process of, of the meetings, the, the, the vast numbers of people turning up at meetings, their responses to the issues. Muldoon was at the height of his power. Uh, he had immense magnetism, and he knew what he was doing, his tactical command of the battlefield was superb. He was a rommel loose in the desert, uh, brilliant in front of the battle. You're not going to like this answer, I can see that. So while he was arousing his mob, he was also listening to find uh, which issues stroked the cords help. of their worry. He worked on fears about the economy, about Pacific Island three. immigration, about and strikers and communists and others. Then we latched on to about six issues where we put the government on one side, ourselves on the other side, and the people on our side. He represented to them uh, the safety and the security of the 60s when he'd been Minister of Finance. And good old Rob, the economic whiz who'd made everything fine in the 60s, had carrots as well as a stick in 75, like national super, a massive political bribe. And I think the decisions were hard-headed, cynical, political decisions based on very careful use of polling data designed to appeal to the lowest common don denominator in the New Zealand psyche. And nothing could stop him. Prominent citizens spoke out, but the more strident he got, the more a worried New Zealand was attracted. A demagogue's a fellow that mouths slogans and um, tries to convince by emotion. I've never adopted that policy. Uh, that was his policy. But Rob Muldoon was unstoppable now. And in November 75, he took the National Party to victory. Now up to Auckland to the man who's going to have a majority of about 20 or 21 from tomorrow onwards. Uh, all I've done is to talk to ordinary New Zealanders in every walk of life and language they can understand. I was born in this country. I was brought up in this country. I know the ordinary bloke in this country. It was a landslide. It would give him absolute power. And this, the most triumphant day of his life, was his late mother's birthday. Built my beach cottage myself, and uh, I'd never built another one. Uh, too old for it now, but um, I had all the problems that the normal young New Zealander on a pretty low salary has. I've had the worst. Hatfields Beach was first an important part of the Muldoon family lifestyle and then part of the Muldoon myth that he was an ordinary relaxed Kiwi bloke. Anybody who's lived in this country, been brought up in this country, is a, is a man in the street. I know him because I'm one of them. Overseas visitors were amazed to find such a controversial political leader in such an unguarded state of beachside bliss. New Zealanders were startled by the lurid shirts, but for years Muldoon's enjoyment was genuine. Very much so. He loved to go swimming and read a book on the beach. But as mum, dad and son Gavin strolled along Hatfields in the summer of 74, accompanied only by a camera crew, their days as a functional Kiwi family were all but over. Even Hatfields would never be the same. Suddenly the picnic stopped. You couldn't do anything after the bag had arrived from Wellington. Gavin already seemed uncomfortable with his father. Daughter Jenny would later temporarily change her surname to avoid being called a Muldoon and Dad's whole soul was given over to Wellington. His uh, thoughts were all politics, so he's really be consumed by the whole business of politics. Although protective and sometimes even sentimental in his relations with Thea, Robert Muldoon was not a romantic man. But like so many other political leaders, newfound power unleashed the libido and Wellington began to whisper about his liaisons with married women. Most often mentioned was Helen Eisenhofer. She and her architect husband Fritz were close to the Muldoons. We went away on Christmas holidays together and have a week together and we did all manner of things together. I, mean, I used to laugh about it first, and, uh, but then later on I got a little bit angry, particularly when it affected um, my children. Helen would never have thought of having him because her husband did more interesting things from her point of view. She was a fun-loving person. If it was asked if it was true that he was, di that, that he was divorcing, me and naming Rob Muldoon as co-respondent and 
You laughed at first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then later, I, 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 I thought I should have just kept my mouth shut and then let them print it and then sue them. <laughs> Get some money out of it. <laughs> Don't think you better put that in. <laughs> There was no doubt, though, that Robert Muldoon could be well, alarmingly think, direct in his sexual overtures. Drunk one night at a party at Bob Jones' house in Lower Hutt, he was direct to the point of being naked. How did people react at the party to seeing that the Prime Minister Oh, they were shocked. Naked. I mean, I was shocked. <laughs> but um, he was drunk, and um, things happened. I mean, these things aren't that peculiar to Muldoon. Uh, it was a fairly respectable cocktail party and, and uh, he went a bit rampant and ended up chasing my sister as it transpired <laughs> around the house and, um, and one of our captains of industry subsequently uh, rescued uh, him actually, he must have been very close to death but she was pretty irate and they, they heard this sort of gurgling and she was sitting on his head in the swimming pool trying to drown him and came very close to doing so. And, Bob Jones' sister Pat doesn't remember the story quite the same way, but there's no doubt Robert Muldoon was drunk, naked and amorous. Soon, though, such episodes would largely be put aside. That ego given power had less room for lust and laughter. You can't govern the, govern the country with a gentle smile. You govern the country... Back Years later, Muldoon would emphatically deny he was possessed by power. Anybody who comes in thinking that it's all about power is an idiot. But no sooner did he have power than he began to abuse it. He issues a press statement saying that the New Zealand superannuation scheme set up, Roger Douglas's idea, set up by the Labour government, is at an end. Because he is the Prime Minister and he declares it at an end by press statement. The day after he was, uh, he called me up and, and uh, I agreed that he had such a, a big majority in the House that, that I would agree that he could stop collecting the money. And Chief Justice of New Zealand says, hey, 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 I mean, in New Zealand, Parliament makes the law. It was an approach that was entirely based on dictatorship, really. If it is irresponsible to care the about... The 70s were already a time of worry and change, a time when our comfortable society discovered divisions we never knew we had. But no one was prepared for the outrageousness of the Muldoon years. He used anyone. He took no hostages. Uh, he, he shot uh, the wounded. He didn't have survivors. But despite the tough, abusive rhetoric, he was a pussycat when it came to practice. Rob Muldoon, for all his public image of being a very hardline politician, was a very cautious man. I mean, he would take personal risks of being in arguing, debating issues, never never admitting he was wrong, but, but in political terms, the decisions he made, he, he took minimal risks with them. The terrible irony was that this cautious, conservative man would hold power with aggression and fear. These were the fear years.